understand that, after all. Uh, we've been talking about it for a few weeks. And after worship today, we're going to watch a movie about Martin Luther and his life. And all of the, the slides that you can see on our presentation are of his face. And we saw him pounding the 95 Theses as the, the basis for this festival, the anniversary of that event. And as you saw, there's even a toy that's been made about Martin Luther. So yeah, I could, I could understand if you think that, that really this Reformation thing is all just about Martin Luther. And after all, we are in a Lutheran church. But it's actually not, believe it or not, about Luther himself. It's not. He, he's just a man. He isn't Jesus. He's not the Savior for our sins. He was a proclaimer of that. And although Martin Luther was certainly the face of this movement in the Reformation, really he was a, a central figure, what actually started the Lutheran church, he, he played a lesser role in, in doing that. You see, we've been talking these last three weeks, three weeks and, and looking at some of the words of our reformers and what they spoke and how it was faithful to God's word. But probably the most famous or the most important of these was a document that was written and then spoken in 1530 called the Augsburg Confession. You can see I'm holding a book of it. It's not quite the whole book, but it's a good chunk of it. On June 25th, 1530, in the German city of Augsburg, a bunch of princes and dukes and theologians without Luther stood up to King Charles V and they read this document called the Augsburg Confession telling the king, this is what we believe and we are standing on this faith. Now, nine years earlier, you remember we talked about this last week, Martin Luther himself stood before that same king, King Charles V, and boldly said, here I stand on God's word even if the king was about to kill him. But what changed in that intervening nine years was that the message about the Reformation had gotten out. The Bible had been translated into German, and for the first time, the German people were able to read God's word in their own language, and they believed, just like Luther, and just like the princes and the dukes and the theologians who were now standing before that king. They recognized that it was based on Jesus Christ and on his work alone that they could stand there before the king knowing they were right with God. Now, in those days, it's important to understand that Germany wasn't what you and I picture it. It looked like this. It was this loosely gathered collection of tiny little principalities and duchies and small county-like states ruled by little princes and dukes and counts and so on. And they were all part of something called the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, as many have noted. It was this collection under King Charles V, who was also a ruler of Spain and ruler of the New World and the colonies going on there. So Charles V was not so much concerned with what some German monk and those who followed him thought about the Bible. He wanted unity. He wanted the people to come in line under him and the Roman Catholic Church because they had greater threats, like the Turks who were knocking at the door of Vienna, threatening to attack it. So he demanded that they come back to the Catholic Church. And his demand was not one that they could take lightly because behind him and behind his authority, he had a grand and vast army that could roll over the counties and principalities in Germany and just wipe them all out. So it was no small thing that they stood up to King Charles V on this day, June 25th, 1530, and said, this is what we believe. We are following the Bible, even if it kills us. 
We are following God's word, O king. It sounds a bit like what we heard from the story of Daniel in the lion's den, but also especially what Jesus foretold would happen to his church when he sends us out into the world from our gospel lesson in Matthew chapter 10. We are called to persevere in confessing and standing firm in our faith. And that can be a dangerous thing as it was for those confessors. But here's what Jesus had to say. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. And on account of you, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now, Jesus knew, as he said these words, long before he he died and rose and ascended into heaven, he knew that when he left this world physically and sent us out as his believers into the world, that we would be like sheep going among the wolves. The world is not exactly going to welcome us with open arms to hear what we have to say from God's word. And just scanning through history, you see that Jesus' words that he prophesied here in Matthew 10 have been quite true. Whether we look at the early church and the believers who were martyrs and died for their faith, some of whom were thrown in to the Roman Colosseum, on display to be fed to the lions. Or you can scan through to the the missionaries who've who've gone out throughout history, whether to India or Japan or China and places like that where they, they lost their lives because they went to tell people about Christ. Now we don't today stand in the same kind of danger. We live in a a society that has freedom of religion and expression, and yet that same attitude can come towards us. And it, it, it did, especially also in Luther's day. It's hard for us to picture, because we have religious freedom, and the influence of the Christian church is much lower than it was in his day, but in his day, the Roman Catholic Church had so much power and so much authority that what they said applied to everyone in Europe. People had stood up and and tried to stand up to the church and were, were put to the, burned at the stake because of it. But now, here in the Augsburg Confession, these princes, these counts, these leaders, what they were doing was putting themselves like the sheep into the wolf's mouth and saying, go ahead and kill us. But we are not, under any circumstances, going to back down from what they believed in, namely the word of God. Jesus himself modeled for us exactly what he meant being the sheep in the wolf's mouth when he went like as a, as a sheep to the slaughter taking on himself the sins of the world and then allowing the Jewish authorities the Romans the wolves if you will to crucify him because he was saving us from our sins He was carrying out this divine promise, knowing that the world rejected him, but also that the world would reject his message and his messengers, just like you and me, if we go out proclaiming that same message. But here's his promise. He says, When they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, You will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. 
Now this promise that Jesus gives us is Jesus as our divine king, ruling from, all, ruling from his throne in heaven, sending his Holy Spirit to give us even the very words to say as we make our confession, as we stand firm in our faith. And that's sort of what happened in Augsburg. The king demanded that they say what it was that was on their hearts or what, what it was that was preventing them from returning to the Catholic Church. So these princes asked Luther and his other theologians, help us to craft a clear confession. And that's what they did. These princes, Elector John the Steadfast, John Frederick of Saxony, and another man named Philip of Hesse. These were the, th- the, the main three who, who stood up, and there were others with them. But not only were they speaking the truth, but they were also using their authority to protect Luther and his theologians from being killed themselves by King Charles. And as long as they were breathing, they were able to do just that. After Luther died, King Charles brought his army and and followed through on his threat to attack the Lutherans, those who followed this teaching. Maybe you and I were not going to get called in front of the king, in front of parliament, that is, and demanded that we make a, a clear confession of our faith upon the threat of death. But have you ever been asked by a neighbor or a relative why it is that you choose to go to church every Sunday afternoon? Or why, or do this, anyone ever ask you, do you actually believe in the Bible in 2017 with that tone and snark in it as well? Do you actually believe that Jesus is the Son of God or that God created the world? Do you actually follow that? Actually, we do. We stand firm on God's word because we know that our shepherd sends us his sheep out into the world knowing that even though the world may want to attack us, we're not going alone. God himself is with us. He is our fortress and our refuge and our strength. He is the one giving us, even in the moments when we're called to the carpet and demanded to give an answer, gives us the words to say. One time, as a vicar, a long time ago, this woman was in a Bible study of mine. We were talking about sharing our faith. And she came week after week. So we were talking about this very verse, how the Holy Spirit gives us the very words to say. And then that, that very week, she was getting her hair cut. And her hairstylist asked her about her faith. She was filled with nervousness because she was the kind of person who said, I, I'm too afraid and too nervous to talk about my faith, Pastor. Well... When she came back the following week, she was bubbling with joy because it just came pouring out of her, she said, as she spoke and expressed words of her faith that she never had thought of. She said, it's true. I didn't even know what to say, but God was there with me and and gave me the words. Maybe you've had that experience too. I'm not sure. But God has clearly given us a promise that he does not send us out by ourselves. Even though his predictions are not always pleasant, this side of heaven, we know that God, Jesus, has made this firm promise to us to stand firm. He also says this, Be innocent as doves and clever as snakes because brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, maybe, maybe you have in your family, everybody is a Christian, who shares your faith. I'm guessing that's probably not the case. In fact, that's pretty rare 
to find somebody whose whole family is Christian. But maybe, more likely, you've experienced Jesus' words already as he describes how following Christ can and does at times divide us from even our own family members who don't believe as we do. And they feel put out or upset that we would follow Jesus and love Jesus more than them. Even in my own family, I've experienced that loss where one side of my family who aren't Christian, I hardly ever talk to anymore. You've experienced that in your own life as well. Whether it's with a family member or a friend or a coworker, you've experienced that wall that goes up the moment you say you're a Christian. Maybe you don't see a brick wall, but you see their eyes glaze over when you start to talk about your faith. And so you know what Jesus said is true. That hasn't changed, not since the day Jesus left heaven and until he comes again. And it was the same in the days of the Reformation. Knowing that pronouncing and, and declaring their faith, these, these reformers were putting their own lives on the line with King Charles because they knew very well that he was not about to accept what they were going to say. And they said it anyway. They remained firm. But look at the promise of Jesus. He says, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. For 500 years, the Lutheran Reformation has been about this idea, standing firm in God's word. It's not easy to do. It's not easy now. It wasn't easy in Luther's day, and it wasn't easy for anyone who's lived in between now and then because we live in a world that doesn't like God's word. And yet, for us, thinking about what all of this means now 500 years later, we are filled with this hope and this confidence from our gracious Lord Jesus to be with us as we continue to stand firm, to attend church, to read God's word, to remember our baptism and celebrate the Lord's Supper, to cling to the promise that we are saved by grace alone, that God loved us, and through faith alone, in the scriptures alone, through Jesus alone, and to God's glory alone. I pray that we, at Savior of the Nations and throughout North America and our fellow, fellow Lutheran congregations, will continue for the next 500 years to remain just as faithful to God's word as Luther and the Reformers and all the dear saints who have gone before us because we have this great promise from our Savior, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Amen. Please stand. Now may this peace that we receive through our gracious Father give us the strength to persevere in confessing and proclaiming where we stand with God's word till the end. Amen.